All right, let's talk about chapter 13 a little bit. Now with chapter 13, I believe I'm missing the first part of 13. So hopefully this takes up towards the end from the very start of chapter 13 till about the cerebellum. So let's just, and the cerebellum is the, the end of the cerebellum portion is gonna be where the final exam is going to start. So cerebellum, parts of the cerebellum will be on the, uh, the third exam. So chapter 13, we're talking about the brain and the cranial nerves, functions of specific regions of the brain, functions of the cranial nerves. So let's discuss generally what we're gonna look at first, right? The brain and the spinal cord are part of the central nervous system. The brain is the part that's obviously contained in the cranial cavity. Now the brain itself controls lots and lots of the body's function. Hypothalamus being a very important one for your you know, blood pressure, for your heart rate, for your, as well as for even things like sex drive and thirst centers, things like that. Those are all going to be very important part of what the brain and specifically the hypothalamus does. And we'll talk about specific parts in a little bit more detail coming up. Now, in terms of the brain itself, it's gonna have separate four different portions, the brainstem, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the cerebrum. Each of these sections or each of these parts are going to have different functions. But keep in mind, because the brain and the spinal cord are part of a pathway, when we talk about the cerebellum being involved in control of movement, balance, posture, right? It means that it's a main control, but there are regions that also has that same function, like the red nuclei for movement. Uh, other regions of the precentral and the postcentral gyrus, even connections from the spinal cord that allows us to have proprioception. All of those signals have to come in to the cerebellum and has to exit out of the cerebellum. So what we're gonna talk about, even though we know movement, learn, practice, complex movements are part of the function of the cerebellum, it doesn't mean that that's the only place where we will see those learned movements and it only is found in the cerebellum, right? So we'll talk about these four regions coming up. Now keep in mind, the cerebrum is where we're talking about with the lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, insular region, right? Those are all the cerebrum. So those are there for higher function, memory, uh, language centers, they allow us to have conscious thought. And as well as, especially when we're talking about the, right, the precentral region, right, in the frontal lobe for body limb control, movement control. Again, we just talked about movement of control for, for cerebellum. There are a lot of different redundancies in the brain. The brain also then later on in the other uh, videos, we're gonna talk about the cranial nerves. So let's talk about the brain stem. And keep in mind in terms of development right here, right? We don't have much time to discuss the development, but what is important to understand in terms of development is that as we develop, we go from a single cell fertilized egg and somehow turn into this trillions of cell three-dimensional baby, right? With four limbs, a head, neck region, torso, abdomen, hip region as well. Now, we will see that the spinal cord and the brain actually comes from a very external region of cells. So the cells out here, the ectoderm will eventually at first be found on the outside of our clusters of cells. Remember, we have this three-dimensional, almost peanut-shaped cluster of cells. The external, the external, external most cluster of cells right down the midline, right in blue right here, will be pushed inwards. So you can imagine having your finger right in the middle and pushing this bluish cluster of cells inwards. As you push it inwards, you slide it all the way down, right? As you slide and push down on the cluster of external cells, they will then and vaginate. And what we're going to see is these region that we initially pushed down will turn into the brain and the spinal cord. They will first turn into neur the neural tube, 
which will then turn into the brain and the spinal cord. This is how the brain and the spinal cord come from the ectoderm, right? In other words, even though the brain and spinal cord are very interior, it comes from the clusters of cells originally found on the exterior regions of our cell cluster. Now, the brainstem is this region that is the start and it is a connection to the spinal cord. So it, the brainstem includes the medulla oblongata, the pons, and then the midbrain region. The medulla is a continuation of the spinal cord. It's a part of the brain that will be found closest to the foramen magnum. Now, saying that the brainstem has lower function does not mean it's got lower importance. We're gonna see in a second that the medulla oblongata is our main cardiac center. It controls your heart rate, your you know, blood pressure as well. And because of that, it is incredibly important for life. It's just lower function because number one, it's under unconscious, subconscious control from the hypothalamus. So, and it's, you know, allows us to have that unconscious control of your blood pressure, which we don't really want to have conscious control over the day to day, the minute to minute, the second to second contraction of your blood vessels that allows us to have blood pressure, right? We want to be able to save that thought process for higher function things like learning anatomy. So here is our initial start of our brainstem, the medulla oblongata. As we go a little bit more caudally towards the head, the superior, then you see the pons. The pons looks like a bulge and it is kind of a bulge that sticks out superior to our medulla oblongata. And as we ascend even more, we are in the middle of the midbrain region right here, right? And part of the midbrain at the back, you're gonna have these four bulges. We call the corpora quadragema. You're gonna have two, one and two, right? on top, superior colliculi, and they have two on the bottom, the inferior colliculi. Now they show it here. I wish they have a third picture showing it on a posterior view so you can really see what it looks like. These superior colliculi, inferior colliculi should be paired together. So let's talk about the medulla, what makes the medulla very important. Number one, right? The medulla is continuous with the spinal cord it contains sensory signals that ascends from your spinal cord upwards. So then it can make contact with the thalamus for that sensory signal to eventually go to the opposite hemisphere of your brain. So in the medulla oblongata, we will see lots and lots of fibers that ducassate or cross over. So we're gonna see descending fibers that are motor signals coming from your precentral gyrus. Think of the precentral gyrus as a control switch that allows you to move the muscles of your limbs. So the control switch is a wire that comes down from the precentral gyrus on the left side of your body, or left side of the brain, left hemisphere. Then that fiber, that nerve, that axon connects with other axon forming descending nerve tracts. And then in the medulla, it crosses over, it decussates. So then as a fiber goes down the medulla, it goes from the left hemisphere of your brain down to the right side of your spinal cord. That decussation allows us to control muscles on opposite sides. So my left hemisphere, left precentral gyrus controls movement of muscles on my right side of my body. The right hemisphere controls movement of muscles on the left side of your body, right? Same, true, same thing is true with the sensory fibers. Sensory signals also cross over at the medulla and it allows us to have the right postcentral gyrus. It's going to decipher sensations from the left side of our body. So there's a crossing over for both sensory and motor signals occurring at the medulla. So it's important for that already. Now, what makes it the utmost importance is what we see here. It is the main regulator of your heart rate, your blood vessel diameter, which will then control your blood pressure, 
and then your main respiratory center. It's also important for swallowing, vomiting, hiccuping, hiccuping, coughing, and sneezing. But what makes it really important is that it acts. It is the main center for cardiovascular and respiratory systems. If the medulla obligata gets damaged, your blood pressure will drop to zero. And depending on where the damage is, it will drop all the way down to zero. And now you can't have blood moving to the brain. You go into hypoxia, hypoxemia, and then death will occur, right? Now, this is exactly what happened to, if you guys remember Dale Earnhardt's death a few decades, like in the 2000s, he had what looked like a pretty, and it looked dangerous, right? It didn't look like a devastating type of car accident when he was in Daytona 500, right? The last lap, he got into a car accident and he, well, he died. And even though they were there within minutes, there was no way of saving him. The reason, reason for it is because when he had that car accident, he had this massive whiplash. The whiplash caused by the sudden stopping caused his head to go forward and then back. It moved so violently forward that it dislocated the skull from the C1 vertebrae. Because it's now dislocated from C1, the dense process found in the C2 vertebrae, the axis went up the foramen magnum and destroyed the medulla obligata. At that point, the blood pressure goes to zero. There'd be no more blood flow going to the brain and he would be unconscious at that point. There's also no way of saving him at that point. So he would have died minutes, if not seconds. He would have been passed out within seconds. He would have been dead within minutes, even if he was in the OR already and this happened. Why? It's because by obliterating the medulla obligata, your respiratory and cardiovascular centers are gone. Your blood pressure goes to zero. And next thing you know, you can't move blood to the brain. That's where they lose consciousness. Now the pyramids, consists of descending motor tracts that decussates over its anterior surface, thus allowing us to have hemispheric control. So if you have the left hemisphere of the brain, it controls the opposite half of the body. Decussation again is the crossing over. We also see olives here. Now the olives that we see in the right medulla obligata, I don't know, you can see it on the lateral surface right here. The olives look like little olives, looks like little round circular right, material found laterally in the medulla. And they contain nuclei that helps regulate balance, coordination, and modulation of sound from the inner ear. In other words, they contain the cell bodies of your eighth cranial nerve, your vestibulocochlear nerve. This nerve, vestibular part, allows us to have balance, coordination, the cochlear part allows us to understand and hear sounds. Now, as we ascend up the brainstem, we have the pons. Now, obviously with the pons, since it's connected to the medulla, ascending motor tracts go from the medulla up the pons on the way to the thalamus, which then goes to your post-central gyrus, which allows us to kind of decipher the sensation coming in from a particular limb, from a particular region of that limb. So the pons is going to be connected to the medulla and therefore also have superior or ascending sensory signals, also has descending motor signals on the way down from the precentral gyrus. Those signals goes through the pons on the way to the medulla where it finally crosses over at the medulla obligatus pyramids. Now, besides having tracts that goes ascends and descends, we also see the pontine nuclei, All right? The pontine nuclei are relays between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. The pons contains cerebellar peduncles, white myelinated axons that are going to connect the cerebellum to the rest of the brain to connect the cerebellum to the rest of the spinal cord. Now, the cerebellum itself 
is completely cut away from the rest of the brain. There's no physical connection between the cerebellum directly to, right, directly to the occipital lobe. So if you take a look right here, here's a cerebellum. Notice there's a cut here. And then the body will actually see a piece of dura mater that we call the tentorium cerebelli. And that tentorium cerebelli actually disconnects the cerebellum from the occipital and the temporal lobe region and the parietal lobe region. So the only way that the cerebellum right here receives signals, the only way the cerebellum has output out and in is through these cerebellar peduncles. We're gonna see that there's a superior, middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. So here's a, all right? In the cerebellar peduncles, the middle one's the biggest one and it looks like a music note, right? You have a superior cerebellar peduncle, a middle, very round, and then a inferior one that's kind of moving towards the, each other. Now those peduncles are connections between the cerebellum and the pons and the rest of the brain. If we would cut the cerebellar peduncles, then the cerebellum will have no way to function. It will not receive any signals from your limbs. It will receive no signals from the rest of the brain. It'll have no way to output its signals out from the cerebellum into the rest of the body or the brain. So these peduncles that are found in the pons are incredibly important because they allow us to connect the cerebellum to the rest of the spinal cord, to the rest of the brain. It also is where we see the sleep centers and it is our accessory respiratory center, allowing us to adjust our respiration. Example, as you're walking into a building or into a bar, and now you see a lot of people smoking outside, you don't wanna smell that smoke, so what do you do? You take a deep breath and then you hold your breath as you walk through that smoky region. That is their ponte nucleus. Another example, you're about to dive underwater because you have to pick up something from the floor of the pool. As you dive underwater, you take a deep breath and hold it as you dive down. That is your ponte, all right, your ponte nucleus that allows us to adjust that respiration. It's not the main respiratory center, the main one that drives respiration and drives your depth of respiration, drives your respiratory rate. The main respiratory center is found in the medulla. The midbrain. Now the midbrain region is this region right up here. It contains the corpora quadrigima and the pineal gland. When we take a cut of it right here and look down, then we'll see right? Regions that stain black and regions that stain red. The regions that stain black right here, that region right here is called the substantia nigra. Then we have a red nuclei, right? Both are important for movement. Now, we'll first talk about the superior and inferior colliculi. It's found as part of our tectum, right? The tectum is a posterior region of the midbrain, right? The tectum contains a corpora quadrigima and the anterior part contains a cerebral peduncles. And the cerebral peduncles are just fibers, motor and sensory fibers moving upwards to the thalamus, right? So these are just fibers, sensory and motor signals coming up and down the thalamus, all right? the ones that go up the thalamus, into the thalamus, has to go through the peduncles. And usually those are our sensory ascending fibers. Then we have motor signals that can come down, make contact with the thalamus, but on its way down, it goes through the cere cerebral peduncle. So peduncles are connections, right? It connects one part of the brain with the other part of the brain. So on the back side right here, then we see the corpora quadrigima split into two superior and two inferior colliculi. Now, those colliculi are very cool, right? The two superior ones are connected 
with the optic nerve. And they're important for visual reflexes. They receive information from the eye skin and causes cerebrum activation. The best example of this, it allows us to track an object in a visual field. So as you see, and if you, know, if you are a baseball pitcher, if you're a basketball player, right? You, if you're a football player and you are a quarterback, right? You will sometimes throw the ball to a area where you think that the wide receiver will be. Not where they are at that point because they're going too fast. If you throw the ball to where they are, by the time the ball gets to that person, the person would be five, 10 yards downfield already, right? So you have to adjust and follow where you think they're gonna be and throw the ball to where you think they will be when you release the ball and the ball gets to them. So instead of, you know, they're doing, an, you know, they're running, if they're running straight ahead, you wanna throw so then it can run underneath it. All right, that is one of the functions of the superior colliculi. It allows you to track. And this is very important because if you imagine when we were first evolving, we didn't have guns at that point. We might have spears. We didn't at that point even have bows and arrows yet, right? So our main hunting skills were with spears that we could throw. Well, if we have a spear we can throw, we need to be able to track that animal. So then as we throw that spear, well, if we throw it where we think it's going, there's a chance it might hit the animal and then we'll have meat for the day, right? But if we throw it to where it is right now, that animal is not going to stay still and you, let you kill it. So what we're going to do is if we throw it to where that animal is, the animal's going to move. We're going to miss all the time. So we have to track that animal and then throw that spear. So then, or if we're using a bow and arrow, shoot that bow and arrow so we can kind of follow along. So as the arrow goes to that correct region, we anticipate the animal being in that precise location. All right, now another thing is that it allows attention to be focused on visual stimuli. So best example as well is when you are driving. If you're driving and then you see, and you look at the, right, your rear view mirror, and then you see some blue and red lights coming at you, right? The cops are coming, right? You don't know it's for you or it's for somebody else in front of you. So you slightly pull over in response to having that cue just by looking in the mirror, right? The blue and red lights allows us to focus our visual field and our you know, eyes to that stimuli so then we can track it. So that we can then figure out, all right, that's a cops, we need to pull over. All right, now the inferior colliculi is for hearing and localizing sound. You guys have been driving before and all of a sudden you hear loud bang. It could be a car accident. It could be a Harley Davidson kind of backfiring. It could be, right, somebody's wheel just exploding, right? But you hear this loud bang. Immediately, you always turn your head to that signal, right? Why? It's because we need to localize the sound. Again, as we were evolving, we were never the strongest, most powerful, most dangerous animals. We were the smartest, but we weren't the most powerful and the most dangerous, right? We had spears, but a spear isn't going to do much if you have a bear running at you and you don't know it's coming at you. So the inferior colliculi becomes important, right? As we're walking, right, down the field, if you hear some rustling to the side, you want to be able to turn your attention so then you can visualize something that might be coming at you. So then you can get your, right, weapon out to protect yourself. That's what we mean by the inferior colliculi, right? It allows us to turn our gaze towards that sound the sound doesn't have to be super loud. It can just be some rustling, right, in long grass. That long grass might be hiding a lion, a bear, a tiger. We don't know, right? We want to be able to visualize it so we can protect ourselves. So this inferior colliculi allows us to turn our gaze, to turn our attention 
to that sound. Now, the red nuclei, I just kind of showed you guys, right? Aids in the subconscious regulation and coordination of motor activities, like walking and then going upstairs or downstairs. In other words, right? Think about all the different muscles required to walk. So when you're taking a step, let's say I'm taking my right foot and I'm pushing off, my left foot's in the air. In order to push off, I need to contract my quadriceps muscles. I need to contract all of the muscles in my right calf, my soleus, my gastrectomias, my right posterior, my posterior tibialis muscles. All of them need to contract so I can push up. I also need to contract my quadriceps so then I can elevate my thigh. I need to elevate right, my thigh as well with my hip flexors. At the same time, I need to inhibit right, the muscles on the opposite side. So in order to step off, I need a lot of movement. I need a lot of muscle contractions. At the same time, I need a lot of muscle inhibition as well. Right? All you think about is just taking a step the red nuclei, all the regions of the brain. They, all right, as soon as you think about taking a step, they take over and subconsciously, they control the contractions of the muscles, the inhibition of the opposite muscles. So then you can have a nice smooth movement. And then as you walk, you go from a walking flat surface and then you go upwards. All you think about is taking that next step, right? As you start moving upwards, up steps and stairs, you're actually contracting muscles that are different. So your gluteus maximus will be more contracted than if you're normal walking. You don't even have to think about it. Why? Because a red nucleus takes over and it's gonna coordinate the activity. Now, the substantia nigra also found in this area. We've talked before about why it's important to have inhibition. This is why it's important that we have inhibitory signals as well. Dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, all three of these kind of neurotransmitters, these monoamines, all three of them can be activating neurotransmitters in some neurons, or it can be inhibitory in other neurons. They can act as both, depending on the kind of receptors we have. Now, for dopamine, neurons found in the substantia nigra. Those neurons, when they receive dopamine, they get inhibited by it. So what we see with these dopamine neurons is people with Parkinson's have the movement disorder due to death of the dopamine neurons found in the substantia nigra. So what happens, right? People with Parkinson's and Parkinsonian-like syndrome have issues with the substantia nigra. And what occurs is that these neurons in a normal non-Parkinsonian person, these neurons are present. Because they're present, dopamine's released. Dopamine's released onto these neurons found in the substantia nigra. The cell bodies are found here. And as dopamine is released on these cell bodies, it causes these cell bodies and these neurons to be inhibited. So it inhibits those unwanted movements, the shaking, the tremors, right? right? Those movements that you see in people with Parkinson's where all of a sudden they have a jerking movement, ataxia, right? Those kind of movements. Normally in people that don't have Parkinson's, all of those movements are inhibited because of the presence of dopamine release to the dopamine neurons found in the substantia nigra. The worse the disease progresses, the greater the loss of the dopamine neurons, the more tremors we see, the more unwanted movements we see at rest, even if we're giving them a large dose of L-dopa, right? So dopamine has a hard time getting through the blood-brain barrier. So in the 1950s, 1940s, we kind of figured out that there were some movement disorders where you see either Parkinsonian tremors, right? Or other movement disorders where it is the absence of dopamine that's causing it. So they thought at first, we just give the person lots of dopamine. The bad news is dopamine is in the same category as epinephrine and norepinephrine. So by the time we give somebody enough dopamine, 
to offset the Parkinsonian syndrome, the dopamine levels in the body were so high that you had this huge increase in heart rate and blood pressure, both not good, right? Because dopamine had a hard time getting through the blood brain barrier, in order for us to have enough dopamine to create an effect, it would have a massive effect on the cardiovascular system, right? So we know that couldn't be the case. We can't just give people dopamine. So what we did instead is give people the precursor, L-DOPA. L-DOPA will get then picked up by the dopamine releasing neurons. Then the L-DOPA gets converted to dopamine. Then the dopamine will be released onto those dopamine neurons. And now we have that inhibition again. The problem is as Parkinson's progresses, you'll have fewer and fewer and fewer neurons in the substantia nigra. So you will have L-DOPA, but then you don't have as many neurons that can pick up L-DOPA, convert it to dopamine, then release the dopamine onto the substantia nigra cells. Without those neurons present, you can give somebody as much L-DOPA as possible. There'll be nothing there to convert it to dopamine. So it stays L-DOPA and you will have tremors. You'll have all the movement disorders. This is one of the reasons why people that have prolonged you know, diseases with Parkinson's, like Michael J. Fox, right? He, I believe, got diagnosed in his 30s and now he's in his mid 50s, if not early 60s, right? At this point, he's had Parkinson's for so long that there are very few dopamine neurons at all in the substantia nigra. We could give him the highest dose of L-DOPA and he will still have issues with movement because there's no more neurons there to pick up the L-DOPA and turn it into dopamine. So what do they do then instead? They put stimulators there, right? Electrical stimulators in the brain. The stimulators then will hopefully, all right, work on the substan whatever substantia nigra cells are still present and inhibit them. So then you can inhibit the unwanted movements. Right, the cerebellum. So in terms of the reticular formation, the reticular formation region is gonna be a region found throughout the brain. So it's not just found in your brain stem, right? It's found throughout the brain. Reticular formation is sometimes known as the reticular activating system. And its main purpose is to control cyclic activities, such as our diurnal sleep-wake patterns, where we sleep at night, wake up during the day, allowing us to have circadian rhythms, right? To be sleepy in the evenings and active in the day. Keep that this in mind, that our circadian rhythms is a learned behavior. This is why you'll see babies that are newborns that will wake up in the middle of the night and stay awake, right? And then be asleep throughout the whole day. Why? It's because they haven't learned that pattern yet. Once they've learned the pattern of being asleep at night, being awake during the day, then we have greater ease for mom and dad to get some rest, right? The cerebellum, right? Again, we kind of mentioned that the peduncles allow the cerebellum to not only connect with the pons, but once the cerebellum connects to the pons, they'll have pathways that send a signal through the superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles to the spinal cord, to the midbrain, right? To the rest of the cerebrum. So the cerebellar peduncles are incredibly important as connecting points. Now, what else do we see in terms of the cerebellum? The white matter resembles a tree, has a name arbor vitae, and then ridges are called folia. Again, gray matter is the cell bodies, white matter are the myelinated axons. Now this Purkinje fibers and Purkinje cells, largest central nervous system type cells in the body, right? Basically the largest neurons. They receive up to 200,000 presynaptic connections to this one postsynaptic Purkinje fiber. They're usually inhibitory, right, and send axons to the cerebellar nuclei. The cortex, the external 
region of the cerebellum. We've heard about the cerebral cortex, external region of the cerebrum, the lobes, right? The cerebellar cortex, even though the cerebellum is much smaller than the cerebrum. Remember, the cerebrum are all the lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal lobes that we found in the brain. So they're pretty big. But the weird thing is, even though the cerebellum is smaller, a third, a quarter, the size of the cerebellum, of uh, the cerebrum, right? Even though the cerebellum is only a quarter or a third the size of the, cere the cerebrum, its cortex has more neurons than the cerebral cortex. Very, very weird. Now, I want you to know the functions, the specific functions for these nodes, for the cerebellum. Number one, what is the flacco-nodular lobe? They're important for balance and eye movement. The vermis, the medial portion. So let's take a look. The vermis is this medial portion that connects the two hemispheres found in the cerebellum, right? The lateral hemisphere found on each side. The flocculonodular, uh, flocculonodular lobes are found, right, superior. Actually, here they kind of flip it up. Inferior, right, aspect of the cerebellum. So the flocculonodular lobe has connection to your cranial nerve nine and allows us to have balance and eye movements. The vermis the, and the medial portion of the hemispheres allows us to have posture, movement, fine motor coordination. So then we can practice, right? So then we can have smooth flowing movement. Example I always have is this. Have you guys ever seen somebody run so fast? in such a coordinated fashion that it looks like they're skating. It looks like they're gliding when they're running. That's because of the cerebellum and the vermis here. The lateral hemispheres is a major portion and they're important because they work with the cerebrum to learn, to practice and plan very complex movements like riding a bike. When you're riding a bike, you need balance. Like, Flocculonodular lobe helps with that. Then you need to be able to, once you are balanced, push on one side without falling over. So that's a learn, practice movement. So then as you push with your right leg, you have enough balance so then you don't fall over on your right side, right? You're able to shift your weight a little bit. So then even though you're pushing with a lot of power on your right leg, right? Because you're leaning to the opposite side, you don't fall off your bike. That's a learn practice movement. And once we learn and we practice and we become good at it, it becomes nice, smooth, right? And second nature. The more you practice, the more ingrained it becomes, right? And then after you learn how to ride a bike, you've learned and practiced for so long, you have such great balance at that point that the only way you will lose the ability to ride a bike is due to any kind of traumatic brain injury or a stroke or some kind of hemorrhage. All right, this is the end of the test three material and I'll end this right now and I should have part two already up.